share that uh, the Lord is a good shepherd. Jesus is a, a very good shepherd. I just feel that I'm supposed to say this, that uh, Jesus the shepherd loves you and longs for you. He wants to make his, his voice known to you and lead you into good pastures. And so I, I just want to share that the things we're going to say, we're, we're going to war with the enemy today, and we're going to be looking at Scripture and how the Holy Spirit speaks and how the enemy speaks. And I just want to know that the Good Shepherd loves you and he longs for you and he wants to be near you. He wants to fill you with his Spirit and heal you and bring you into good pastures. So I want to pray for our kids, pray for us. Uh, it says in Matthew 13 that, this, that Satan comes uh, like a bird and there's the parable and he, he comes and when the word is there, he tries to take it away so that the word of God cannot go into the hearts and change us. And we don't want that. Father God, we come today to you and we just long to hear Jesus' voice. And we want to be given discernment to know between the stranger and the shepherd. We want to know the difference between a shepherd who loves us and a wolf who wants to take us out into the forest to devour us. We want to be made alive in you. We want to be able to hear your voice and, and long for you. We want to be in relationship with you. I thank you for the kids downstairs and what they are learning about the goodness of God and, and who he is. Father God, I just pray that you speak to us through your word. Your word is alive. It's sharp and it's, it pierces our hearts and it corrects us, but it also inspires us. I pray right now um, that we would have open hearts to hear these things and that we would be assessing our heart. We'd be looking at our hearts and assessing our hearts to see where maybe the snake has been speaking to us as in pretending to be an angel of light and that you're calling us to hear your true voice instead. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, kids, you're dismissed. So we're, gonna, we, we're in the Gospel of Matthew, and we just kind of wanted to stop because I, I talked to some different people, and people said, can we go more into what it would look like to distinguish between, we, could, we looked at the temptation of, of Jesus by Satan, and so how do we hear Jesus' voice? through his spirit versus um, Satan's voice. And so this is just a one-off. It's kind of a topical sermon. I'm not really good at topical sermons, but we're going we're gonna to see what we can do here. Right now in our culture, I think we're not living in a world anymore that's kind of like put all their eggs in the Darwin basket. I don't, I don't think we're living in a culture where most people are saying, unless I can prove it from science, I'm going to believe it. I think there's some people who are still holding out for hope that science has all the answers for the world, but many people I talk to know that there's something more. They know that there's something more in our world, and there's a lot of people who are searching, and so this generation is a searching spiritual generation. And I wanna, I wanna say that the rise of um, New Age and mysticism, the rise of paganism in the UK right now, and in Canada, it, it's crazy what's going on. And there's this desire inside every human being that we recognize that we are more than just matter, that there's something transcendent that every soul is searching for. And I think if you would talk to people on the streets, uh, you would find pretty, pretty fast that everybody's had these weird, maybe even paranormal experiences where they know that there's something more. I don't think most people think that when we die, that's it, and there's, no, there's nothing beyond what we can see. And I want us to understand that, that we all want to have God's speaking to us. I think this is a longing that God's put in our hearts, and I, want, I don't want to deny that as Christians, we should be hearing the voice of the Lord. In John 10, Jesus says, the sheep hear my voice. And so I don't want to dissuade us. I want to, I want to encourage us that as Christians, when we pray, we read God's word, we should get guidance directly, subjectively from the Holy Spirit in our life. This is a good thing, but I also want to warn that right now in our culture, um, there's a big move to fill that hunger inside of us, and not every channel that we need is actually from the Lord. And so we looked at these two passages um, that Helen just read, and I want us to understand that all of us probably in our life, according to the scripture, have mistaken Satan's voice at some point in our life with God's. And I want us to understand that Satan is actually way more clever than we understand him to be, and today we want to look at uh, the subtle ways that Satan talks to us. Uh, sometimes when we think about Satan speaking to us, we think of like, yeah, right now I'm tempted to look at pornography, or right now I'm tempted to cheat on my tax return. Those are, um, yeah, those are obviously not from God, but that is, is not as subtle as what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about more subtle ways that Satan will pretend that he is the Holy Spirit. 
And I want us to know that, that God can speak to us and help us correct us and give us discernment over time. So maybe we'll, we're not going to look too much at New Age and different stuff, but I, we're going to look at some, some different things. So what I want to do right off the bat is I want to ask the question, what does Satan sound like when he impersonates an angel of light? Right? So the, the, the Bible is really clear that Satan's not going to come to us as a boogeyman. He's not going to come to us with his teeth bared unless he knows that we're stuck. Typically, he'll come to us as like this loving uncle that wants to share and then change our lives and then be loving towards us, and he'll come pretending that he actually is God. Okay? And, and before we get into the distinguishing between the Satan's voice and the Holy Spirit's voice, I'm going to use a bunch of scripture. What I want to do is I want to just kind of help you to understand Satan's motivation. So in Jude chapter 6, it says that there's all these angels, and they weren't happy with their habitation. They weren't happy with their home, and so it says that they left their habitation, and they went elsewhere. This is in Jude chapter 6, and what this is describing is that the devil and his angels, they were not satisfied to serve God in the realm that God had created, so they desired to go somewhere else where they could be their own leaders. They wanted to be like God, and so when Adam and Eve, the first temptation we see in the book of Genesis, Satan is using the motivation which he believes, and he's fully on board with, is that you don't have to live in the habitation or the home that God has built for you, because we haven't, and we've left. So I'm inviting you to leave with me. I'm inviting for you to create your own form of reality, because the form of reality that he has given to you is not good enough. And this is how Satan, this is the motivation of Satan's heart that he wants to create his own destiny, his own realm, because he's not satisfied with the one that he's been given. And so, so what Satan wants to do to us is to encourage us to fall even further away from God's created order, his de the destiny of humans, and what we've been created to be as human beings. He's, he wants us to, to, to complete this estrangement from God. So Adam and Eve fell, and they started this process of walking away, and Satan wants to completely finish this, sever our connection to God, because he knows that when we are connected to God, connected to reality, that's where human flourishing is. And so he wants to isolate us from God, and we're going to look later about how he does this as a wolf. Wolves scatter the sheep, so they're by themselves, and then they isolate them, and then they devour them. And so I have it on the screen that Satan introduces an attitude of independence from God, an independence from a need from God, an independence from the laws and the wisdom of God, an independence from communication from God, an independence from the nature and the order given by God. And so the more that Satan pulls us away from God, the more we become like him, the more we move away from our created order. And so what I want to do right now we're going to just go through, I'm not going to read every verse because we're not going to have time to read all of them, but I'm going to send out an email later with all the verses and they'll be, they'll be printed out or you can, you can email it. You can check it out for yourself. I'm going to reference them. We're going to look at some of them. We're going to look at eight ways in which the Holy Spirit speaks or works and ways that Satan will speak and work. And sometimes he'll mimic God and sometimes he'll full on do something different. And I want us to understand that to the untrained eye, Satan and the Holy Spirit are indistinguishable sometimes. That's how sneaky he is. He's been working on this for a long time. And when we use scripture, we can understand the difference between the two. One is there to devour and eventually destroy, and the other one is to build us up. So I have eight different ways on the, on the left and on the right. And today I want to just look at when, we, when we're in our prayer life or when we're alone with the Lord, does it sound more like the left or does it sound more like the right? And maybe even when you're thinking about this, I want you to think about popular Christian teachers and, and pastors. Do they sound like the left or do they sound like the right? Okay, so we're going we're to go through this and we're going to talk and then maybe at the end we'll circle back and in our discussion time we can look at these eight things and you can ask for practical examples, you can give examples in your life. I want us to know that these are all scriptural. So the first thing that uh, when God is it was speaking to us, the Holy Spirit, he will specifically convict us of revealed sin. He will reveal something that's not right as a human being that we are doing that he doesn't like and it's destroying us. But he will always give an alternative and he'll clearly present what he wants instead. Right? And so God will say in 1 John chapter 3, it says that all sin is lawlessness. And so that means that God has created a pattern for what a human being should be. 
And if, if a human being does this, a human will be blessed and a human will fulfill its, in, its intention and its intended design. And so whenever we sin and we do something wrong, we might not even know it and the Holy Spirit will come to us, it says in John 16, and he'll convict us. He'll show us what's wrong and he'll show us an alternative, his alternative. But Satan will mimic this. We can talk about this. this, is super crazy. He will mimic this conviction of God, but what he'll do is he'll make it cloudy, confusing, and he'll make a generalized accusation and shame us. And so in Revelation 12, it says that Satan is the accuser of the brothers and sisters, of us Christians, and night and day he accuses us. And so Satan's never going to reveal something in your life that needs to change, but once you realize that it's a problem, he will continue to pinpoint it and create a general shame over it, but he will never give you a way out. Okay, can you guys see the difference there? Let's keep going here. The second one is that the Holy Spirit will actually attack or confront weak character in us to transform and humble us by pulling us toward God and away from our sin. And so in Romans 8, 13, and 14, in Galatians 5, verse 17, it specifically is talking, not just God generally, it's specifically talking about the Holy Spirit, how he wants to go to war with the parts of us that shouldn't be there. And the parts of us that maybe we even think are part of our real identity, he wants to go to war with them to extract those things out and replace them with the true image of Christ. But when Satan does this, he doesn't ever attack the character. He doesn't attack the problem. He attacks the identity. And Satan desires to isolate and to destroy you. And so he'll push you away from God, and he'll push you toward your sin. And in in John 10, Jesus talks about this, like he's a wolf, and he will scatter you. He'll create a shame over you so that you will leave the shepherd that you'll feel that you're not worthy of God because there's something wrong in your life, and so he will get you to scatter and to run away from the flock even, to run away from other brothers and sisters, not to tell anybody about it, and he'll get you to run off into the forest by yourself, and he'll be waiting for you. And so the, the Holy Spirit will never, if he shows you problems in your life, he'll never say, and if you tell anybody else about this, they will judge you and destroy you. He'll say, go tell other Christians about this and come under the grace that they have, and I'm going to restore you. Satan says, Get alone. Be alone. Don't tell anybody about this. Be by yourself. Can you see the difference there? God always is trying to bring us back to himself and back to each other. Number three, and we're going through these fast. We can give some examples when we get into the discussion time. You might even have better examples than I have of how Satan does this. The Holy Spirit, when he's actually working, he will make us take responsibility for our actions so that we will reconcile and we restore relationships to one another. If there's something wrong between us and a brother or sister, he will make us take responsibility for it. This in Ephesians 4, verse 30, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And it says, here's a list of all these bad things that happen relationally, but he says, forgive. Have tender hearts toward each other and forgive one another. I want to be careful here. There's sometimes where people actually have done things to us and we, there's nothing to take responsibility for. We are straight up victims. And there are times when God has to work through our hearts and what that means. I'm not specifically talking about this. I'm talking about when there's a struggle between us and another Christian, God will say, I know that the person is, is wrong. Even if you're 25% wrong and they're 75% wrong, God will say, I want you to take responsibility about what you can fix inside of yourself that's leading to, to resentment and to hurt and to brokenness here. They are their own person. So the Holy Spirit will say, I, I, I'm gonna, I want to change what you can change, not something else. In Ephesians 4, verse 26, it's, it's, this is counterposing the Holy Spirit and Satan's work. In F- Ephesians 4, 26, it says, Do not be angry. Do not go to bed angry, because this gives the devil a foothold. It gives the devil a, a chance relationally to drive a wedge in the relationship. And so when the Holy Spirit, or when Satan works, he wants somebody else to take responsibility for the whole situation. Do you guys know why he does that? Do you know why he creates this resentment? If there's something in our life that we don't have the ability to change, and it bugs us and it bugs us, and we get resentful, 
what ends up happening is it, it leads to deep resentment because we feel like we cannot change the situation. It's above us, and it creates a sense of despair and hopelessness. And Satan's always like, focus on something you can't change. Focus on the other person. Don't focus on yourself because then I can isolate you and you can continue to, to hate this person and to focus on something that nothing can change. Can you see that? The Holy Spirit wants us to be healed and to forgive and to put it back to, 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 to whatever we can do to restore the relationship. Number four, the Holy Spirit, th this is crazy, we're going to talk about this. This is really interesting. The Holy Spirit, when he works, he will inspire us towards self-denial. But at the same time, he will maintain our dignity as a human and actually strengthen that dignity. The more that we lower ourselves and pour ourselves out for other human beings, the more inner strength we gain and the more sense of well-being and, and, and the sense of structure in our life. And the reason why is in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it says, in the image of God, he created us. Male and female, he created us. And he made us to rule the world to take care of the animals, to take care of the environment. He's made us a certain way. And so what God does is he tries to bring us back to our intended created order. And so the more that we pour ourselves out for one another, that's the way we were made to be, the more sense of structure and stability and strength we actually gain. <clears throat> the crazy thing is when Satan does this, he never picks the moderate middle position. He either tells you that you are dirt, or he'll tell you that you're God. He'll deny Genesis 1, 26 and 27. He'll either say, I want you to, uh, to loathe yourself, to hate yourself, to, to subdue yourself, and it's, it's not for the sake of other people. It's not for laying your life down. He wants you to do this so that you will destroy yourself. You're dirt, you're nothing. Or what he'll do is he'll say, you are actually God. You need to self-indulge. You need to go for your passions, you need to have self-love, and you become an animal. Both of these are extreme, and, and he can do it very subtly. And so on the screen, I'm not going to read it, but 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 to 5, it's talking about these demons, doctrines of demons. There'll be false teachers who come who tell you to deny yourself and to destroy yourself for the sake of God, and they destroy your human dignity. God's not interested in doing that. God is not interested in us in self-denying for the sake of self-denying. We're supposed to self-deny to give up for other people. Jesus didn't lower himself for no reason. He lowered himself because he loves us. And on the opposite side, Titus 3, 2 Peter 2, verse 18 and 19, I'm not going to read all those. It's this, this pursuit of self-love, this pursuit of using up your love on yourself because you are actually God. And so Satan wants to not put you in the middle, put you in your place, put you where God's intended. You're either God or you're dirt. Okay. There's a lot here, guys. I know there's a lot here, but we're at the end of this, we want to go through this, and maybe this is helping you to discern the difference between God's voice and the Holy Spirit's voice. The Holy Spirit is orderly and consistent when he changes us. So in my life right now, the Holy Spirit's telling me one of the fruits of the Spirit is patience. And it's like, you can't just decide to be patient, Steve. You're not a patient person. You're not patient with your kids. You're not patient with your wife. You're not patient with everybody. You need to have a change in the inside out. And so the Holy Spirit will continue to bug me about this, and he will continue to do this in a gentle way because he wants to breed a patience and a healing and a stability in the process of transformation. He's not happy with where I am right now in my impatience. But in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, it says that God is not a God of disorder, but he's a God of order and peace. In 2 Corinthians 3, it says that God slowly changes us. He doesn't overwhelm us and say, here's the straight goods on where you are as a human being. You're a disaster, so you have to fix all of it at once. He actually, the Holy Spirit doesn't reveal to us all the areas he wants to switch. He's having mercy on us, and he slowly does one at a time. Satan will mimic this. He knows that we're trying as hard as we can, and we, we desire to be godly like God, so then he will say, 
have you noticed all these different areas where you're not very good at? Maybe you see a mature brother or sister in Christ, and he says, see all these areas. Man, you've got to work on all of these areas at once. And sometimes I do this in my life. I'm trying to fix all these different areas. I'm working on this area, working on this area, and then I realize over many months that I am spinning my wheels. I'm not actually making any progress, and it's not the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Can you guys see this? When, the Holy, when Satan does this, he will create fear and doubt and confusion and instability long-term in a Christian. That they need to fix these things in their life, and there's this angst and the sense of, I'm always one step behind where I should be, and I'm wasting my life. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will gently but firmly continue to grow himself in you. This isn't us doing it. And so I just want to be really careful. I don't want to be really helping us here that when Satan does this, he will mimic the Holy Spirit, but it will not actually help. It'll just be like a a shotgun approach. Isn't that crazy? The Holy Spirit can actually do this. He can tell us to do good things, but tell us to do way too many things and overwhelm us and confuse us and create despair. Okay, number six should be obvious, but it's not. The Holy Spirit will always show us the cost first, and then he will reward us. He'll show us the reward second. He'll say, uh, the Holy Spirit is a straight shooter. The, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He, he longs for us to have peace and joy, but he tells us the cost. Jesus says in Luke 14, this is what I want from you. This is what it means to be a disciple. I'm telling you right in the beginning, here's the fine print here. All of it is because I love you, and I don't want you to be deceived. It'll work out in the end, but it's not going to be roses and unicorns. This is going to be a struggle, but I love you, and I'll be there with you. (laughs) Satan shows us the prize, but he lets us discover the penalty by ourselves. (laughs) Have you guys ever ever experienced this? Something too good to be true, right? Right? So there's a book called Your Best Life Now by a famous pastor in the the States. That book is a disaster. Your Best Life Now. It's saying if if we think that there's something and it's too good to be true, it might actually be. In Romans 6, 21, Paul's saying you used to have all these things in your life that you ran to and you enjoyed, and then they ended up leading to death. How excited are you about those things now? It's in Romans 6, verse 20 to 21. Okay, we got two more. We got two more, and then I want to just, I'm going to open this up, and we're going to start talking about these things practically. This one's really important. Holy Spirit's work versus Satan's work. I want to just share right now that there's, there's a lot of deception in the North American church. There's a lot of people who will say, the Holy Spirit's saying this, the Holy Spirit's doing this, blah, 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 oh, Holy Spirit this, and it never, ever seems to get around to Jesus. That's a pretty big red flag. So I'm just going to read. We're going to read a couple of these because they're just too good to pass up. Just too good to pass up. This is specifically in 1 John chapter 4. In 1 John chapter 4, listen to what what the, the, um, the Apostle John says. He says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not from God, but every spirit that does acknowledge Jesus is from God. So he's specifically talking here about there's people back in the first century who denied that Jesus actually came to earth as a human being. But as a general principle, I think what we need to understand is there's any spirit or any teacher who comes to us and they deny or they refuse to talk about the life, the death of Jesus, his lordship, all the important things about who Jesus is, and they want to talk to you about something else, but they don't want to ever talk about Jesus, that's demonic. It doesn't matter if they say Holy Spirit, it, it's demonic. The Holy Spirit specifically says, John, in John, Jesus says in John, in John chapter 16, When the Holy Spirit comes, he has no desire to bring glory to himself. 
He has no desire to talk about himself. What does he desire to do? He desires to reveal the things about who I am and to make them known to you so that you will be changed. I want us to understand that in the, in the New Testament, mostly when it says to have faith, does it say to have faith in the Holy Spirit or does it have, say to have faith in the Father? There's a couple times, but for the majority of the time, it's saying that the majority of our faith comes in recognizing and knowing Jesus Christ. When the Holy Spirit is with us, he shows us our desperate need for God as a human being, that we need him more than we need life itself. The real Holy Spirit will show us our weakness so that we can put all of our eggs in the Jesus basket and take them out of ours. That's the actual Holy Spirit. And so mature Christians like Philippians 3, verse 3, 2 Corinthians 12, Paul is specifically saying, I have nothing in myself. It's all God. It's all God's power. I have nothing. And so I glory in Jesus. I put all my focus in Jesus. I put all my trust in Jesus. I put everything in that basket because I know he's the only one who can do what I need. I can't do it. That's the real Holy Spirit. Satan will come to us pretending he is the Holy Spirit and he will do this. He will keep the focus on ourself. He will deny a need for God and he will boast about human ability. And so I want to be, I want to be very clear that the New Age movement has moved into Christianity and it has mixed and it's using the same terminology and there's a lot in the Christian church in the West that is actually New Age. And it is the human potential movement where it's saying you have the ability, God wants to give you the ability to level up on your own. And the Bible doesn't teach this. It says you have to become nothing that he can become everything. He will surge through you with his power, not yours. And I want to be very clear on this. It doesn't matter if somebody says, Holy Spirit, Jesus, whatever, if the message is always that you can level up, that is demonic. The Bible says that you need to be emptied so he can be filled in you. And that's where the power comes. First, 2 Peter 2 is talking about false teachers and it's a celebration of humanity. It's a celebration of human potential at the expense of knowing God. Genesis 3, verse 5. Remember what Satan said? He says, God's lying to you. That's a paraphrase, but he's saying, he doesn't want you to eat from the fruit because then you will become like God. Satan's like, I left my home of habitation. I left my, my natural home where I served God because I want to be God, and I'm inviting you to become God too. This is what God says about when we put our faith in ourselves. In Jeremiah 17, verse 5, it says, this is what the Lord says, Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength, and turn their hearts away from the Lord. There's a curse upon us when we do that and we don't recognize that all the power is in this God who wants to love us and fill us. Okay, last one. This one should be obvious too, uh, and on, on principle it is obvious, but I want to just talk about this. The Holy Spirit loves Scripture because the Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture. It's His work. And so the Holy Spirit will illuminate it. He will shine into your heart and reveal to you spiritual truths about what it's saying. It's not just words on a paper. The Holy Spirit will give you understanding to know it better so that you can be transformed. And he'll create a hunger inside of you for Scripture and a desire to follow it because you're not following words on a page, you're following the king behind it. You are reforming yourself back to the intention of humanity. And so in 1 John 4, he also says, I think this one's worth reading too. Those who belong to this world, or he says, okay, but you belong to God, my dear children. And you've already won the victory over these false teachers because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. These people belong to the world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. But we belong to God. This is one of the apostles, right? Well, the one that was one of Jesus' best friends. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us, listen to the apostles, the teachers, the ones who are writing scripture. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. And that is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. 
In John 14, verse 26, Jesus says, when the Father sends the Advocate, when He sends the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything and remind you of everything I've told you. When the Holy Spirit comes into our life, He starts to show us how powerful this Jesus is and how important the words that Jesus speaks to us are. And that they're not just human words by some guru. This is, these are the words of God Himself. In Ezekiel 36, it's so hundreds of years before Jesus and hundreds of years before Pentecost. God promised that he would put his spirit in us to follow his decrees and to be careful to keep all of his laws. That There'd be this hunger inside of us to want God and to want to follow God. Now, this should, this should be obvious, but the Holy or Satan hates Scripture. But if he's pretending he's the Holy Spirit, he won't say that. He full-on hates it. He wouldn't because we would know. How does he do this instead? He'll cloud our understanding. So when you read scripture, you read it, and then a couple weeks later, you're reading another section, and it looks like what you are reading right now looks different from what you were reading a week ago. And he'll put the question in your head, hey, do you notice how there's a discrepancy here? Do you notice how there's something different going on here? Which of the two is right? One of them is wrong. Instead of humbling ourselves and saying, I'm not seeing this right, it's, hey, Somebody screwed this up. I think this is just a human author. He will cloud our understanding um, over time so that when we're reading it, we're not picking up what it's actually saying. We're picking up other things. And he will provide alluring alternatives. And so a way that he does this is he, we read scripture and he's like, have you read these other Christian authors? There's nothing wrong with reading other Christian authors, but he'd be like, have you ever read these guys? They're, they, they, they're filled with the Spirit. Check them out. And you read them, and they sound so godly, they sound so good, but if you really discern what they're saying, they're actually saying the opposite of Scripture, but they're doing it in a subtle way. And he'll say, I, I need you to think about this. Reading Scripture is not enough. You have to read these other people because they seem to have, they seem to have this connection with God that you're not getting over here. I can help you with this over here. But then when you start studying it deeply, it just seems like, there's mixing truth and goodness with error. So the, Satan, when he does this, he'll also refute the credibility of Scripture. He, will, he can bring signs and wonders to show us this person's credible because of the things that they do. But the things that they teach are opposite of Scripture. And Jesus promises that this will happen. In Revelation, it says that Satan is this dragon who inspires this false prophet to do signs and wonders to pull the whole world away from truth. Okay. One last thing, and then I want to open this up for discussion. In Matthew 26, Jesus is in the garden with the disciples, and he's about to get arrested, and he's saying, Jesus is so loving that he knows that this is going to be a serious time for himself, but he's already resolved to go to the cross. And so now he's focusing on the disciples. And he's like, man, I love you guys, so I want to just give you some help here. Don't worry about me. I'll figure that out. I want to help you. And so he says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And so Jesus knows that pretty quick, in a matter of minutes, in a matter of hours, this giant mob with torches and swords are going to come into the garden and they're going to take Jesus away and do whatever they want to Jesus. And he's saying, be on guard, watch and pray, be careful, because your hour of temptation is coming too. The chance for you to run away from God, to, to hide, to, to, to do the wrong thing is coming. And so what does Jesus say to help? There's two things, watch and pray. And I just want to talk about this for a second. In Proverbs 4.23, it says, above all else, Guard your heart from everything that you do flows from it. And conversely, in Proverbs 28, it says, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will be delivered. And so Jesus wants us to have this understanding inside of our hearts that we're sheep and that we can be deceived. He wants us to understand that to be alert and to be aware that when we hear voices, we shouldn't just assume we intrinsically can hear the shepherd's voice, but that we should test what we hear against Scripture, against truth, because there's voices that are trying to pull us away from our home with the Lord so they can take us into the forest 
isolate us, scatter us, and devour us. And so we have to be aware that there is a spiritual battle. There are voices that are speaking to you long-term to take you away from faith, to plant doubt in your heart to keep you away from your shepherd. And, and the second thing in Romans 14.4 and Jude 24, this is talking about Jesus is the one who actually can keep us safe. We have to come to Jesus with this desperation and this belief that he can protect us. We have to have this humility that says, I'm not going to figure this out my own. I need you to be here with me on this. So I want to open this up for discussion. We're going to just take a couple minutes here, and then we're going to move to communion. But maybe, does anybody have any examples, or does anybody want to ask questions of clarification on some of these points where the Holy Spirit versus Satan, and how subtle this can be? Does anybody want to ask or give examples? Let's take a couple minutes for each one, and let's just go through all eight. Was that? Yeah. Big time. That's really good, right? Satan is, unless Satan knows that we are stuck, he is always going to mix truth and falsehood because he's here to seduce. He does not have the power to full on take. He needs our will to join with him before he can plant the seed of destruction. That's really good. Can you say it again? Yeah, so there's like a lie, and it's surrounded by truth so that you will believe and you'll put your guard down. This isn't a wolf. One of the things I often hear when people is that the Lord is telling you to do this. Right. And usually it's So that you don't argue with Yeah, so, yeah, that, something that's really good, Dennis. The Lord will be dishonored if somebody lives their life like that. Like, as if the Holy Spirit is schizophrenic. And he's telling me to do this, and now he's telling me to do this, and it's like this, and there's nothing to show, and there's no deep fruit and lasting. You, you can't transplant a plant every couple weeks. You have to leave it where it is. You have to water it. You have to have consistency, or the plant will die. That's a good point. Does anybody want to go deeper into one of these eight things? Yep. Well, I think we've seen in the last three years where the sheep have uh, actually followed the sheep. Mm hmm And then on that, <laughs> you really wonder, you know, how they uh, well fed people to follow them. Mm. And they were clearly on the rock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have any? We can look at any of these eight. We can go deeper. I can give you examples of how this looks. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think with identity, it, yeah, we, sh- we should be careful that it's not what necessarily what I do is what I am. I mean, they're connected. They come from the outflow of the heart. But Satan wants us to focus on where we're at right now and make that our identity and the things that we do, the things that we are. Jesus says that life is more than the abundance of wealth. And so we so easily get caught up on with what we can see and what we can do versus where our heart is and where we are in the journey with the Lord. I want to just be also clear that the Holy Spirit 1 and 2, He will be gentle, but He will be firm, and He will come to us and convict. There's some people who say, God would never say anything negative to me. That's not true. He will definitely say, there's gangrene, there's cancer, I'm here to cut it out, let's do it. I will cut it out, please let me cut it out. He's not going to say, I love you so much, we're going to pretend there's no cancer here. It's not true. But when he does it, he doesn't destroy our very identity. He's actually giving us our true identity, the more that that gets taken out of our life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Satan's Satan's always going to come to us as the loving uncle, and it's like your dad just doesn't get it. Your dad just doesn't get it that you want to have fun, and I understand fun. I understand you, but your dad's just man. He's he's here to kill your joy. That's what happened in Genesis. The Satan came to him. He's like he doesn't. He wants to hold out on you because you were meant for more. You're meant to be like God. And he created you that way, but now he's kind of holding back. And God's like, that's not at all true. <laughs> that's not at all true. And so he'll come to us, and you know, he'll come to us pretending that he has our best, his best, our best interest in mind. Because he's not going to come to us being like, I want to destroy you. If you follow me for 20 years, you might commit suicide or you won't be a Christian anymore. He's not going to say that. He's saying, like, lighten up. This morality thing, this thing that... Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. That doesn't, that's not true. And God's like, you have no idea the goodness I want to give to you if you follow me. Ephesians 3 says, beyond 
all that we can ask or imagine. It's a good point, Brooklyn. I give an example, or is it going to create a grenade here right before for communion and our potluck? You guys want to, you guys want an example? Yeah. Don't be offended if you like this book, but you should be concerned. Over two million copies in print. I really like what you said. A lie. How did you say that again? A lie. Sorry, put you on. Lying the truth propagates the lie. Yeah. So a little bit of, if you're telling the truth and you throw a little lie in there, the lie is true. Right. Right. Okay, hear me out on this, guys. Some of you guys might still like this book. This book has a lot of good things in it. I hope you guys can't read it from back here. This book has a lot of good things in it about how to mourn and God's heart for those who mourn. And so there is a lot of truth in this book and a lot of good things. And if we could extract them from the book without the rest, this book would be very good. I have never read this book, but I started to read it this week, and I just flipped to random pages, and I started reading it, and it sounds so beautiful, it sounds so good, and there's insidious things in here. There's things in here that are very good, but there's also stuff which actually the Bible would call demonic. And some of you guys are, I don't know what you guys think, and you guys probably don't like this, but I would encourage you, you can sit down with me, and we can look at this together. The name of this book is by William P. Young. It is The Shack. And there is some very good stuff here. I want to be honest, there's some very good stuff in this. But if you look on one to eight on this list, there's some stuff in this book that if you follow it and if you start to believe it, can shipwreck your faith. And so just as an example, one thing that he says is that uh, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the Father, they, they kind of go on this weekend trip with this man whose daughter got abducted a long time ago, and they, they, they meet him in the shack where this all happened, and they want to they kind of create more, like a sense of mourning and therapy with him, but they start to introduce things which the Bible has never taught about God, and which are actually, will, if you believe them, they look very beautiful at first, but they'll set a hook and they will destroy you later. <clears throat> One example is that all hierarchy is man-driven and it's man-made. It's diabolical, it's of the devil, and the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son, there's no hierarchy in them. We can get into that, that's Trinitarian theology, but they say that, that all hierarchy is actually of the devil. The Bible is really clear that um, God puts governments in place and he takes them down, that he's put parents in charge of children, he's put authority in, in um, discipleship, so that there's leaders in churches, but also leaders who, who mentor other Christians. But what he ends up saying is he teaches this thing called process theology and open theology that God is actually submitting himself to creation because he wants to submit and empty himself 
because that's what love is. And so the God works with inside of creation, and God submits to us, and God grows and changes the way that we do, and God's inspired the way we are. This is just one example, but what will happen is if you believe that, you will not believe that God can convict you and change you, and that ultimately God is not sovereign. This is one example. There's, there's, there's many examples. I was talking to Rob about it. I, this morning I read it, and some stuff that they were, they were talking about sin and how God doesn't think sin is real in this book. And that keeping rules and keeping commands is really bad. We should just have a relationship with God. But Jesus specifically says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So I, I know this is maybe a, like a, a first time you've ever heard this. Come and talk to me more about this. But I want us to understand, if you read William P. Young's books now, he's deconstructing the Christian faith. So this, this was written in 2007. He's writing books now about how to get away from your faith, how to get rid of Christianity in your life. And that's where he's, this is a journey he's on. The seeds are already in this book. And so that's just, just a, a little example. There's, there's, there's a lot of this going on in the Christian faith. We need to know the Word of God and know that Jesus Christ longs for us. He longs to know us, and he longs to be our king, our master, because he has good things planned for us. He's got so many good things, but we need to submit to him. We don't need to tell him what to do. We need to come underneath him. And the Holy Spirit, when, he, when the Holy Spirit grabs us and does this, he can take our life and turn it upside down. But it, it all has to do with truth. So sorry, I threw that bomb there. I'll sit down with anybody if you guys want to look through some of the stuff and how that, 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 that process develops, how the hook is set, but nobody can see it. They can just see the bait. Like, I'll sit down with you. We can talk about it. But right now, I want to move into a time of communion.